You're listening to The Roots, a podcast from Minnesota AMA District 23 Armca. I'm your host, Jackie Reese. Let's dive deeper into what makes our district so great. This podcast was prepared by an independent contractor and may not be the views of the board of directors of District 23 Armca or any of their sponsors or affiliates. Hey everybody, before we get into episode 16 with Nick Swenson, I just want to let you know that this is actually going to be a two-part episode. Nick and I ended up talking for about an hour about his preparation for ISDE, his background in District 23 Armca, and how the trip actually went for him. So this first episode is a bit about Nick and his preparation for the race, and Part two for episode 17 will contain his results, his experiences, um, and how the race actually works. I was very interested to hear about how everything meshed together um, in this very complicated race. So before we get started with episode 16 with Nick, um, I just want to take a moment to thank the sponsors of District 23 Armca, Fly Racing, Nomura Technologies, BCMX Adventure Park, Moto City Raceway, Burn Benders Raceway, and Motokazi Race Promotions. Let's hear more from Nick. Welcome everybody to episode 16 of The Roots with Nick Swenson. Nick, how's it going tonight? Going great. How's everyone? Good. Good, Can't good. Hear <laughs> Can you hear everybody? Uh, so you've had kind of a crazy year. Um, I want to I wanna get into I, everything ISDE, of course. Um, but starting at the beginning, how were you introduced to motorcycling? So I was pretty young. I was four years old. Uh, my old man's been racing his whole life. He got into it himself. Um, I'm pretty fortunate to have a dad who's really dedicated to the sport. Um, brought me to a lot of races. Um, got me my first dirt bike, second dirt bike, third, fourth, fifth. Uh, brought me to so many different races and I really fell in love with it. I didn't really have friends around um, like my high school or my middle school that rode dirt bikes. So um, I spent a lot of time at the tracks with my buddies that did ride and that was super cool. I kind of shaped my childhood um, riding with my older brother, just loving it really going to motocross races, motocazis, um, and eventually kind of fell in love with hair scrambles and enduros, uh, really kind of became my specialty. So, um, really spent a lot of time doing it and still do obviously. So, yeah, for sure. So at, at what point did you really find that love for riding off-road compared to riding motocross? When I got good at it, <laughs> I think <laughs> I wasn't ever as good at uh, riding motocross, um, but I think my dad was more off-road oriented. So he just brought me to more off-road events. And what he always said was, you know, you ride so much more, uh, like an hour or two versus maybe a four lap motocross race. So that was always my perspective, but I really just kind of got better at it and was, had more friends in the sport. So it's like, okay, yeah, let's go, let's go race woods. Yeah. So how do you think riding both of those disciplines helped you to become the rider that you are now? Well, I tell people all the time, if you're going to be a good motor, you got to race some woods. If you're going to be a good woods rider, you got to race some moto. Um, Just line changes, line things, uh, jumping, aggressiveness, intensity. If I didn't race motocross, I wouldn't be good at any of those things, really. Um, Having that intensity that you can bring to it maybe a more of an endurance style race will help you because you can kind of have those moments of intensity, have those moments where, okay, you got to think more logically. So nobody can go two hours straight as fast as they can go. Well, take that back. Some people can, (laughs) but uh, you just kind of got to ride more in your head a little bit, a little smarter. Um, But I tell people that all the time. If you want to be a good woods rider, you got to race some motocross because you will be better. Yeah, absolutely. And, and here we see, you know, a lot of our hair scramble and off-road races, including the motocross track at some of these events. Um, and you can definitely tell who has had a motocross mm-hmm. background and who hasn't had a motocross background at those events. Um, so that's really sure. cool to hear that, that it's important to you. Um, and just that's your advice for other people as well. Um, you know, I still look a little silly, probably a little bit on <laughs> motor tracks, but you know, my, 
<laughs> both my wheels don't get off the ground very often so <laughs> I do what I can <laughs> do you like it that way or would you rather get some more air time I, w- I just want to learn how to whip like I feel like my <laughs> Instagram profile would be so much cooler <laughs> uh, you know I'm in the same boat seriously I've had butt whips for my entire life so I think that's just how it's gonna be <laughs> <laughs> well they say I think Ricky Carmichael or somebody faster than me said if you're asking how to whip you probably shouldn't be whipping right so <laughs> yeah that's Wheels my perspective <laughs> yep. yeah um was there anyone that you looked up to growing up um someone that you idolized riding wise or maybe um someone who was a mentor towards you well a lot of people in the sport um I think growing up growing up I had a lot of friends that my dad knew um who kind of looked at me as like their kid before they had kids, which was super cool. I kind of knew everyone at the local district races. Uh, Matt Stavish, who never had kids of his own, has always been a dad to me. Um, Nathan Furter, when I was kind of, I think I was maybe my first B race, he was just starting to kind of win double A races. And I was like, wow, that's that guy is going to be the next thing. And kind of growing up took me until – the six days to finally beat him but I finally did it and uh you know those are just a couple of people um that have kind of shaped my career given me advice advice uh bike setup just helped me out um and without those guys no doubt I probably wouldn't have the the drive or the love for the sport that I do um but um for the best I think everybody who's kind of in their shoes where they were needs a guy like me to kind of come up and now I I'm seeing it where I'm at. Like there's people who are kind of coming through the B class ranks and it's like, whoa, like they're kind of looking at me like that. Um, and so it's cool. It's, it's kind of brings it full circle in a way. Yeah, for sure. I, I've gotten to that point in my life where I'm like, oh, it's time to give back to what gave me so much. And, um, it's cool to hear that you have that in maybe a little bit different way than I do, but that it has come full circle for you as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier in the year, uh, right after you had just qualified for ISD. Um, and we were talking about kind of your preparation going into that race, what all went into that for you? Um, and maybe what happened at the qualifying race in general. So that goes all the way back to February, um, which, you know, it's October now. And I was actually training for the national enduro series, which I've done for few years um kind of going through high school and coming out of that a race for gas gas and then uh i was kind of coming into it you know i wanted to win double a class uh, and training for the first round i went down there with a buddy and it was going great and i ended up hitting a tree really hard broke my collarbone so i was really bummed out missed the start of the series so i kind of took a step back i was like all right what what can i do like to salvage this season and I always wanted to do this race and uh, it's called the international six day enduro and it's six days straight of racing. And it's always been on my bucket list because my dad did it in 1999. So I was like, you know, that, that'd be really cool. It's in Italy this year. I haven't really been able to travel the last you know, year with COVID. So kind of set my sights on that, went to a uh, qualifier round in South Carolina, really high speed. Uh, they're, they're grass track type events. So they're maybe 10 to 15 feet wide, uh, kind of, you know, higher speed, five, six miles tops for a section. And, um, you're done in 10 minutes. So really high speed and really intense. And I think I'm better at that style racing, maybe because I didn't have to train as much, but, uh, going into that, I was really confident they'd take the top seven guys. Um, and so, I was confident I could do it. I put together a good race in South Carolina, went to Michigan and did it, uh, and, and ended up qualifying. So that's kind of when the work started, uh, after I finished top seven in the East coast. After that, it was kind of game time. I had to buy another dirt bike. I bought a bunch of parts, got a lot of sponsors, which really helped out because sending a dirt bike and racing in Italy isn't cheap. So, uh, boxed the bike up, said goodbye to it. I didn't hear it from anyone for like three months. Didn't know if my bike was in the Atlantic somewhere. (laughs) 
so I, I, you know, now here we are a month after the race and I haven't heard anything from where my bike is. So kind of written it off at this point. Um, so that, that's kind of just the basic, like the bike is in itself, uh, you know, between the bike and the parts, uh, the gear, the, just the kind of support to get over there. But then me physically, I was riding every single day for two months kind of like this summer I sacrificed a lot just because I knew that the toughest days of that race weren't going to be the first couple. Now, I've done two day events before, but I've never raced six days in a row. So I kind of didn't know what to expect, but I knew what to expect. Um, but I wanted to be prepared. So I luckily had a bike here that I've been riding all year. And I think I put on around a hundred hours in those couple of months of, just riding, just riding as much as I could and not really, um, not really intense riding, but just put a couple hours on the bike in a day type riding, um, which paid off big time because those that day three came and I got out of bed and I'm like, you know, I've kind of like gotten over the hump of, you know, my body is really deteriorated. I'm tired, but it's not worse than yesterday. So I don't, I think I'm okay. Um, but just riding every single day was huge for me and, um, and it paid off big time. Cool. So did you, did you try to ride different conditions while you were riding that much like sand or rocks, or did you have any idea of what you would need to do to prepare for the conditions in Italy? So I figured, um, where the race was, it was in the Northern part of Italy, just South of Milan. And so that area is pretty mountainy, pretty steep, uh, but not like Rocky mountains. They're not, it, it's strange. It was, um, I was expecting it to be more Rocky, but it was, it ended up being really dry, not so much Rocky, but just like really dry kind of skatey ground. Um, and so I had been riding, you know, I knew it was going to be kind of grass tracky, faster, open, riding but i was riding more woods type of riding i went to a handful of cambridge motocross practices just to help with that intensity um went to meadow a handful of times and you know i was just riding kind of local tracks local buddies places uh but a little bit everything i wasn't riding the same same tracks every day or every practice so i was kind of trying to change it up but it was nowhere near what it was like over there. I was, you know, luckily my suspension and everything I, I felt okay with over there, but looking back on it, I would have done things differently. I would have kind of tried to maybe nail down a place where it was uh, faster because it was really fast over there, uh, steeper and a little more challenging. Um, because it was, it was extremely difficult. I've never really raced on conditions like that. It was really dusty. Uh, I tell people it was like, you know how like really old uh, pavement gets and it kind of like chunks out after a while and there's big chunks of pavement. That's how it was. Like it was, it was insane. I've never ridden on stuff like that. So pretty cool though. Um, can't really say I've ridden in Italy before, but now I can. So it was, it was awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Is there anywhere around here that comes to mind um, that would have helped you prepare for conditions like that? Or would you have had to have traveled somewhere else? Uh, if I could have, maybe I should have talked to Johnny Martin, ridden down there a little bit, but uh, just some really steep ground uh, would have helped tremendously because it was all off camera. Those Italians really know how to lay out grass tracks. There was, you know, because before the race, we walked, I don't know, 50 miles like the week before of, of kind of how the special tests were going to be. Uh, so I knew really quick, it was going to be really challenging. It was going to be really hilly and around here. It's tough. I live in West Minneapolis or West Metro. So around here, there's, it's pretty flat. Um, so boy, I don't know, maybe, I, there's nothing like what, what it was like. There was, there was, there was nothing. I've been to, I've been to almost 40 states riding my dirt bike and uh, I've never really ridden anything like that. 
I guess it's a testament to why they have that race there. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty awesome. It was really cool. So part of your preparation was doing some uh, District 23 arm car races this, this summer and the spring. Um, how were those races for you? Uh, good. I, uh, I always love racing local races. I think um, arm car really has a premier platform and series in the Midwest um, with, you know, obviously a great double a row, but also B and C and a classes are always stacked. There's always good, good people. And you know, it's going to be a straightforward event and you're not going to get lost in kind of the basics of, uh, of a woods race. I've been to a lot of them around the country where all of a sudden you pop out into a field in the middle of nowhere and you're like, Oh man, I just drove like 10 hours for this and I'm lost in the woods. Like <laughs> that, that, I don't, that has never happened to me in the district 23 race. So, uh, unfortunately I've been getting beat by Lone Kiddock over the last year, year and a half, couple of years. So, um, you know, it's awesome. Uh, you know, that, that just drives the sport more, but, uh, we have a lot of fun together kind of traveling around and, um, I enjoy local races, get to see a lot of, a lot of good people and friends and, uh, I grew up here. So yeah, I enjoy racing them. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, Logan even beat you on this podcast. So I don't know how that's going to go for you guys. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to talk about that. Uh, so... you know, we actually have a zoom call right after this. We're going to talk about our plans for next year. So awesome. um, maybe try and put together a little, um, uh, little effort to, travel to these races it's pretty challenging when you know we're six hours farther than like even tanner whipple who's in chicago so it's tough yeah yeah having a buddy always makes it better course driving oh, and yeah. just getting to the races right. um so we have a few listener questions for you later in the show but i want to bump one of them up now from reese hoffarth um he asked what actually happened at the akeley enduro so Funny story. I haven't really told anybody this. Uh, that was just a local race. I went up there. Um, it's a memorial race um, set up for Floyd, who that, that Akeley trailhead was the first, if I'm not mistaken, trailhead in the state. So I, they were putting a, um, a sign up there for him, and I really wanted to go up there. I think it was pretty cool. Because um, without a guy like that in the sport, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And uh, I wanted to go up there and just have a fun day and not crash. This is a week before I leave for Italy. And so I've been riding every single day, like I said, rode the day before. So we go up there and uh, have, have a good first couple of sections. I think Logan and I were within 10, 15 seconds. And, you know, we're looking at our, our uh, times. So I'm like, oh man, I think he got me. So I was pushing it a little bit more on that next one. And I ended up hitting, uh, just kind of clipping something. And I knew I was done right there. My, my, uh, my radiator folded in. And of course my collarbone was hurting. And I'm like, oh no, this is the same one I just broke this spring. And uh, I'm leaving in a week. So I was really bummed out. I ended up getting it checked out and it was broken. I bent the plate too. Uh, so I was really frustrated. Here I am leaving in like five days at this point, and I got a broken collarbone. So um, I was like, "Well, I'm not gonna just like give up." I and it's still bolted together, right? Like, it's strong, I guess. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I ended up going over there, and um, I just didn't wear a neck brace, which was kind of tough. Um, Due to family injury, I've always worn a neck brace. My mom doesn't let me ride without one, so I just didn't bring it. I didn't pack it in my suit, in my my gear bag, but um, ended up being okay. I was, I mean, it was hurting big time after after um, a few days, but I had it taped up and um, I made it through. Yeah. That's... So that's what happened at Akeley. Unfortunately, I, I watered really hard. <laughs> Yeah, not a good way to start out a, a trip, really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's always that guy, though, um, they say, who will go there. Usually they get there first, put the bike together, and then they'll go out and try and prove on the test track that they're the fastest guy there, and then they crash. Well, I didn't do that. Actually, I did that, too, but 
I did that uh, in Minnesota before I even went. So it's frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my last question about how you were preparing for your trip in general. Um, you did quite a bit of fundraising. Like you mentioned earlier, it's expensive to ship a bike, ship all your stuff, get yourself over there, um, get yourself really prepared for this race. How, how did your fundraising go? What kind of stuff were you, were you into? Um, and I guess how expensive was that trip? <laughs> uh, I try not to think about that. I, <laughs> it's probably I, good. yeah, uh, this isn't exactly a cheap sport. So, um, no, fundraising was awesome. Luckily I have uh, a lot of friends, a lot of family. And like I said, people that I've known through racing that really kind of supported me. There's a lot of people who really want to go to this race and they would just never have the opportunity to, they never have the speed or the money. And so, um, I sold t-shirts. I think I sold like 170 t-shirts, which is a few thousand bucks, which was awesome. Um, I sold little logo spots on my dirt bike for a couple hundred bucks each, um, made some money there. I was on a club team and, uh, it was a memorial team. So, um, the team sent me a thousand bucks towards my entry fee, which was great. I did a little, uh, bike giveaway. Uh, people could, you know, send me money and, and enter to win this motorcycle. And, and that went really well too. Um, and so all in all, I probably made seven, eight grand, uh, to go towards this. Um, uh, and I think the team bill was 3,500 bucks to be like, um, to ship your bike, to have all the team support, the fuel, stuff like that, which crazy story. When they were filling up all the fuel tanks at, in Italy, it took the team an hour and a half at the gas station to fill up all these gas cans for the week. Wow. That was over 2,600 bucks of fuel. Wow. So kind of puts into perspective the like logistics that go into it. Um, which I was kind of blown away. They have, they have this thing dialed. Like everything that was going on was extremely top-notch, professional, and it was just super cool to be a part of it all. Um, I felt like a factory rider in a way, like the whole time. It was super cool. Um, but, yeah, like I just had a lot of support, a lot of people that I hadn't really maybe like heard from in a while or um, talked to, and they bought a shirt or they just kind of wanted to be a part of it and they followed along and, uh, maybe made a comment on my post during the week, uh, which was awesome. Any, anything kind of helped when I was getting off the bike at like uh, five o'clock at night, four thirty, after just changing two tires and an air filter in fifteen minutes, eating the huge bowl of pasta, going back to the hotel room, eating another couple bowls, and then going to bed at like nine thirty. I mean, it was a full day, and I'm trying to type a little Instagram post and then wake up in the morning to do it all over again. And you got all these Instagram, you know, messages, keep going, we're following. And it was super cool. So uh, thank you to everyone who bought everyone who cares enough to be listening right now. Um, you know, without you guys, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to do it. So. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. It's uh incredible how tight this community is and how supportive they are when, you know, when people are doing cool things or when people are injured, like this community always comes together. It's, it's really awesome to see. Yeah. We're a little family. You know, we are, I say that all the time. It's, uh, it's definitely shaped my childhood and kind of formed me into the guy I am now. So, um, I look at all the people at the track, like I've seen these guys for some of them my whole life, 15 years to go into these races that, you know, we look at each other like, what, what, you know, what's going on? Give him a big hug. And it's just super cool. I don't know where else I can find that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely special. And that's it for episode 16 with Nick Swenson. Part two coming up in two Mondays for episode 17 of The Roots by District 23 Armka and proudly presented by our sponsors, Fly Racing, Nimura Technologies, BCMX Adventure Park, Moto City Raceway, Burn Benders Raceway, and Motokazi Race Promotions. See you in two Mondays. Thanks for joining us. Catch us every other Monday wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on our YouTube page. <laughs>